Hi, my name is Graham Brookie, and I'm the director and managing editor of the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Welcome to Coffee Talks with Digital Sherlock's or with the DFR Lab. I'm so happy to be joined today uh, by the Foreign Minister of Latvia, Egers Renkevich, a, a, a tremendous friend and ally of the Atlantic Council, a tremendous partner of the Atlantic Council. The first question is that the Baltic states have long been a target of and frankly, a leader in responding to and building resilience around uh, foreign influence operations or, or attempts from external actors to interfere with internal affairs. So what can, the first question is, what can the world learn from the experience of Latvia? Well, thank you very much, Graham, for having me. And great to be back uh, this time in a bit uh, different setting in a distance, uh, coffee drinking and discussion, but I very much value also cooperation with the Atlantic Council and uh, you are doing great work uh, in promoting transatlantic relations. Answering your question, indeed, Latvia has been under a kind of information warfare attacks from our immediate neighbor, the Russian Federation, for many years. Um, subjects are changing, but the narratives are always almost the same failing country, uh, security issues, um, also issues that are related with that or another minority treatment policy and so on and so on and so on. If we compare uh, the COVID-19 period with let's say uh, history of two years or, or some other period in the history, then I would say that uh, narratives are not changing. It's again about failing state that is not able to uh, work efficiently to counter uh, coronavirus. And of course, we all are struggling now with economic consequences of this health crisis. And of course, there are many stories about um, raising unemployment and the government that is not able to counter that. But there is also a big difference. And the difference is that uh, up till around mid of April, or even a bit earlier than mid of April, uh, that kind of propaganda message was in full swing. We didn't hear or watch stories about pandemic in the Russian Federation. We were hearing that everything is just fine. But when there was a change in Russia's policy, when they started to implement lockdown policies and other restrictions, then we saw also that actually that propaganda narrative was changing and actually decreasing. That is something that I would definitely admit, however, there is another part, and that's the social media, and that is what we have seen, uh, the spread of fake news. I would say that there is a kind of two categories in this fake news operation. One is clearly state-sponsored, but another is uh, very much created by all kinds of conspiracy groups. Um, by the way, we see also that the Russian government itself is now fighting some of fake news there. So I think that to some extent, now everyone is affected by the stories that coronavirus was created by 5G networks or created in Chinese, American, Latvian, Russian labs or wherever else, that actually there is no virus, but there is a great conspiracy by some bold hidden governments or Bill Gates is mentioned or George Soros is mentioned. So you can find all types of those things. And I think that to some extent, we are experiencing also that for the first time, many governments that were using fake news are actually now confronted by fake news. And I wish them good luck to find the, what they were using so efficiently now on their own. You touched on something particularly interesting for us. At the DFR lab, we think about disinformation uh, many times in three broad buckets. One is a geopolitical bucket, and that's where we kind of consider foreign influence operations. Another is an ideological bucket, uh, like 
is spreading false information intentionally for ideological gain, whether that's international actors or domestic actors. And then it, one other one that we're seeing a lot in the context of coronavirus is economic disinformation. And that's the spread of, you know, uh, snake oil cures for coronavirus mm. or large scale market manipulation. And so as you, in the context of coronavirus, we're facing what the World Health Organization has dubbed an infodemic, right? An overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, uh, that leads to a situation in which we're over inundated and have less of an ability to figure out and sort fact from fiction, especially in the face of a public health crisis. And so the question is, how has that changed your role or how has that changed your duties in the course of a public health response noting something that you uh, touched on a little bit earlier in that the narratives aren't necessarily different the disinformation narratives aren't necessarily mm -hmm. different just the news cycle and the news of the day is different we have an interesting pattern uh, on one hand when the government is confronted with health crisis and the government of Latvia introduced so-called emergency situation on, Il, on 12th of March, mm -hmm. uh, when we didn't have uh, many cases, where most of coronavirus cases were originated abroad, people were coming from vacations, from visits, and uh, they detected that more and more are getting ill. And then government decided to act closing schools, also introducing some restrictions. But actually, we had very balanced policy. We didn't, let's say, introduce full lockdown. Cafes and restaurants were still open throughout the whole year. Well, they had to observe some restrictions. However, we also immediately started the massive um, information uh, and here I would say that it was not only the government that did it, but also uh, a lot of health professionals were recording some video uh, pledges to the public, uh, asking them to stay at home, to have the distancing. Also, uh, not only politicians or prime minister or minister of health, but also um, let's say experts. And in Latvia, it was interesting that we have one a uh, very good uh, expert, uh, public health expert, especially on infections, who is Russian, and another who is Latvian, addressing, let's say, both communities. Mm -hmm. So all those, uh, let's say, messages asking people really to be serious, they work. We also noted that for the first time, also many of those who were very much influenced by the Russian, uh, let's say, uh, media, they were also starting to pay attention to what the government is advising. And we also see that there was even further change when Russia was introducing those measures. And to that extent, I would say that we see an interesting pattern. On one hand, we saw those messages uh, from Sputnik, from RT, from Russian propaganda outlets still trying to say that you guys are failing as always. On the other hand, they were themselves saying, look, this is serious. And they are not able to hide that there are problems with coronavirus or economic problems in Russia or medic squad not receiving pay as promised. And so to that end, uh, I would say that uh, rule number one, what we saw, the need to communicate from government on a daily basis. There are press conferences, briefings broadcasted by public TV, broadcasted by many private TV stations and also online and people are watching. And basically up till uh, easing of uh, those restrictions, things were observed by general public. Of course there were cases, but general public really understood the gravity of, of problems. Second, we also decided that we need to inject financial resources so that there are uh, news and also coverages and experts being interviewed all the time. So you need to inject in the public media. 
still they are critical of government, still they don't like many things, but at least uh, we have sense that not only public TV and radio, but also private media outlets, they need to get uh, financial support and backing so that they can work informing public. We are not censoring anyone, but the money is essential here. And our independent board was, was working there. And the third thing, look, I think that uh, I can only praise uh, both our public health officials who were coming out telling what to do. Their appeals on video were very, very emotional, but also very strong. And also general public. People on Facebook and Twitter were sharing the information Social media was uh, actually doing great work uh, by labeling what they saw as fake news, suggesting that is the, let's say, uh, source that you should search for information. In our case, our own National Center for Preventing and Controlling Diseases, and so on. So also general public was very helpful also saying, no, guys, you are sharing now uh, disinformation or you are sharing fake news. On the other hand, we are still trying to get into those groups that are still true believers that Earth is flat and, uh, and uh, coronavirus was originated by 5G. Unfortunately, that is going to be a never-ending fight. Right. The way that we think about responding to that challenge is by building resilience. And by all measures on the uh, challenge of disinformation, Latvia and the rest of the Baltic states have, have a a large degree of, of digital resilience against that disinformation because there's been a, such a long history of it. Uh, one of the, uh, or another topic that we've touched on is the fact that disinformation is designed to drive us apart rather than closer together. And so in the, in the face of a public health crisis, when external actors are, are seeding disinformation, and then, frankly, calling into question any assessments of disinformation. For instance, there were recent reports that uh, the nation of China tried to uh, influence the wider European Union in order to kind of draw down or water down the assessment of Chinese influence operations about coronavirus itself. Uh, how do we maintain the ability to speak with one voice in free and open societies in the face of disinformation that doesn't really recognize our national borders or one specific social media platform or one specific news outlet. In your role as, as foreign minister, how do you conceptualize that, that challenge and work with uh, other foreign ministers and other countries in order to mount, meet that challenge? I think that uh, since we are meeting online as the European Union Foreign Affairs Council and also as NATO, foreign ministers, we had an online meeting on April 2nd. In most of those online meetings that are more frequent than normal, at least twice a month, we normally meet once a month, but in an online format, at least twice a month, uh, the issue of what we call infodemia or disinformation is always one of the topics. Mm -hmm. It was never the case before, even when we were raising that six, five years ago, it was not that we were using each and every meeting when we were touching upon COVID issues that we need also to counter this information. That's a good sign because that's where we try to coordinate already our policies and also to task European External Action Service to work out proposals. They have a great team, which is called uh, Stratcom East, uh, that probably is now widening their work. It's not only Russia, but also other actors. Also, you mentioned China. But I think that also it is very important that we are not trying to influence what experts are writing. Uh, in this country, part of the success was that government always was listening to what public health experts are suggesting, not one or another politician is suggesting how to counter COVID. It's the same with infodemia. Let's listen to what experts are suggesting. Let's wait our policy options and let's respond, but let's not try to suppress what they are reporting. That's the first step. If you do that, that's the first step 
to the big disaster because at one point if you are saying to your experts no 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 i want to have let's say milder report or don't write this or don't do that then we are losing as decision makers a sense of where we are heading so from that point of view i would say that we definitely would love to see strengthening of the stratcom in the european union our NATO Stratcom here in Riga is doing great work for NATO. And then I believe that we need actually to get NATO EU cooperation. It was already good before COVID, but it was very narrowly oriented. Now we need to broaden the scope of their work to include also how we are responding to Russia, how we are responding to China, how we are responding to those uh, who are not state driven forces but are still very dangerous and then finally uh, look uh, censorship doesn't work if people really think that you are trying to suppress something and to delete accounts all the time or or report them sometimes you must do it then they will not believe also the government information so the only way is that the government tries to work with public send concise, clear, strong, and logic message why we do that or why we don't do this. That opening of economy is needed, but opening can happen only if you are reaching certain a level of, let's say, uh, success in, in fighting COVID. And we all understand that we will not eliminate this virus for time being before vaccine is being created or medicine is being created, but at least we must live with it in a way that doesn't harm so much our normal way of life or at least doesn't influence that but i would say that realization of infodemia was much quicker than when we had the similar issues back in 2014-16 about interfering in elections about uh, using our publics when it comes to what happened in europe what happened in uh, Eastern uh, Ukraine or what happened with Crimea. We are learning much quicker and that's a good sign, but still a lot of things for policy makers to understand that you need to listen to advice, you need to implement the advice of, of your experts and then probably also you can tackle those kind of problems. Completely understood. And we're here to help with that challenge and, and work with partners around that challenge, including uh, with our staff that is based where you are in Riga. Uh, with the last question, uh, I will note that uh, I have my coffee right here. Uh, the mug says, what good have I done today? That's a, a question that guides our work at the DFR Lab and, and at the Atlantic Council. Uh, but I would note that I'm also about six hours behind where you're at right now from a safe social distance. So it's probably not time for coffee where you are. Uh, is it, uh, the last question is, is it time for a Latvian balsam uh, where you are? Is coffee not appropriate at this point in the day? I would answer this way. For me, it's a tea time. Uh, still some work to do. It's my fifth online meeting today. I had a great day, but let me just say two things. I think that uh, regardless where we are right now, uh, what you are doing uh, through those online meetings and interviews and also keeping transatlantic uh, ties and links alive and strong is extremely important. Uh, this government got through revolution because now all government and parliament meetings are digital online, all the voting is online. In Europe, we are working also through video conferencing. And I think that is going to be a very efficient way. But when this is over, still the human touch and need to meet in person and discuss those things will be prevailing. So. I just want to thank you for keeping this, let's say, format alive. Drinking coffee, what, 5,000 miles or so, uh, keeping that kind of physical distance is, of course, great. But I think that uh, we need to meet and we need to discuss, and we will do that definitely when this is over, also in person. And I, I drink normally coffee black. I drink my tea also no sugar 
no milk, but I very much hope that we will be able to resume normal interaction very soon and then all those lessons learned will be applied on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, I can't thank you enough again. And I look forward to doing this again and staying connected, but also having that coffee in person whenever possible, sometime very, very soon. Thank you again, Mr. Vinkevich. We'll talk very soon.